I'm going to teach you all today how to do violence in the workplace. Yes. <laughs> so that when you're mad at your bosses and your coworkers, you'll you'll know how to take out your frustration. Good. No, that's not actually what we're going to teach today. Today's presentation on violence in the workplace is going to go over a few definitions first so that you understand what workplace violence means. First of all, workplace violence doesn't just mean a physical assault. It can also be verbal threats or damage to property. So it's really any type of criminal activity that occurs at the workplace could be considered workplace violence, unless um, you're talking about a simple theft. But if it's some type of crime that either infers or implies violence or involves violence against a person or destruction of property, that's considered workplace violence. And a workplace is any location where you do your job. So obviously, it's the library if you work at the library. But if any of you ever take work home or you work out of satellite locations, that can also be considered a workplace. And that may not happen in your profession, but it happens in some other professions. So for example, if somebody does work from home and there's an act of violence in the home related to the job, that can still be considered workplace violence. Now, work presents an interesting dynamic. Okay? That's because we don't choose who we work with normally. We get employed by somebody because we need a job and we need a paycheck. And we normally do not get to choose who we work with. In other aspects of our lives, we get to choose who we socialize with, who we marry, who we're friends with. Sometimes you can choose who becomes part of your family, not always. But in the workplace, you don't get that opportunity. You are just stuck working with whoever else is working there. And sometimes personalities don't mesh. Everybody's shaking their heads, so I guess you've all had experience with that. Right. So some of the people you work with, in other words, you might not choose to have in your life normally, but now you're forced to try and get along with them. This is the percentages of people who commit violence in the workplace. Stranger violence, about 60%. Okay? And that's of all workplace homicides. So of all the homicides that occur in the workplace, about 60% of them are by strangers. Now, a stranger is going to be defined as somebody who is not a client and not a normal user and is not somebody employed here. It's somebody that, that's not connected with the workplace in any way, shape, or form and comes in and commits a crime. That may be a robbery. It may be a homicide. It could be a theft. It could be vandalism. But it's somebody who has no connection with that business at all. Client violence is about 30%. So that's your normal users or your clients, or if it's a medical facility, your patients. Whoever that business services, that's considered your clients. And really only about 10% of workplace violence is committed by employees. And an employee could be an actual paid employee of the facility. It could be a volunteer who works there, or it could be someone connected to an employee or a volunteer. So. If someone here is having issues with um, an adult child or even a teenage child and that child comes to the workplace to take out their frustrations on you and they commit an act of violence, that's still considered workplace violence because that person was connected to you, the employee. This, this happens frequently with um, estranged spouses or estranged boyfriend, girlfriend, some type of estranged relationship where one half comes to the workplace and commits an act of violence. We've had that happen here in Colorado Springs that has resulted in something as serious as a homicide um, where we had an estranged husband, I think it was, come into a workplace and shoot and kill people because his wife worked there. And then we've also had things of a more minor nature where um, I think it was ex-girlfriend went to new girlfriend's workplace and just punched her in the face, walked in and punched her. So I consider that relatively minor um, in comparison to the homicide, but that's still an act of workplace violence. Okay? And that would be considered employee violence because it was connected to somebody who works there. So the stranger violence, again, is somebody who is not, has no legitimate reason whatsoever to be there. They're not a client, they're not a patient, they're not a user, they have no business being at the site or being in that place of business whatsoever. 
so this is going to be a regular criminal who comes there to commit a crime, or it could be an act of terrorism. When we're talking about some of the government contractors or government facilities we have in our area, I do enhanced threat and risk assessments on those to mitigate acts of terrorism. So for a small local business, stranger violence is going to be a local criminal. For some of these bigger type facilities that we have in our area, you may be looking at terrorist activity, but all of that is going to fall under stranger violence. Robberies will fall under that. When banks are robbed, normally that's a stranger that comes in and robs that bank. Okay. So client violence, again, is somebody who's a normal recipient of your business. They're a client, they're a patient, they're somebody with a legitimate reason to be there, but for some reason, during their interaction with you as an employee or during their use of the facility, they become agitated, they become unhappy, they become disgruntled with something. So something happens during them legitimately being there and they commit an act of violence. Okay? So what types of things here at the library could cause this or have you seen cause people to get upset? They come here to check out a book or use a computer for some legitimate reason normally with no intent to commit an act of violence, and then they become upset. Fines. Fines. And when we did the Diffusing Hostile People class, if any of you were in that, we talked about what makes people angry, and that was one of the things that kept coming up repeatedly. I've done it here and at the Sand Creek Library were fines. People get really upset that they owe fines, and then I understand they can't check out further materials or use computers if they owe money. So anything else make people angry enough that they may commit an act of workplace violence? Uh, we've had people get upset over being in each, in each other's space in the internet areas. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had some people escalate a situation. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So people getting upset about personal space and mm -hmm. feeling like their space was invaded when they're using computers. And things. Anything else? Uh, they run into people they know from outside. Good outside. one. I was going to actually bring that up. So you come here to use the library. Right? I come here to sip my tea from Starbucks and to read a book and just chill out. And now somebody that I know, an ex-neighbor or something, or an ex-coworker comes into the library and we hate each other. And this person sees me and of course they have to come right over and start an argument with me. So I didn't intend to come to the library today and get upset or get in a fight with somebody, but it happened. And that's, that's a legitimate reason why workplace violence can happen by a client or a recipient, okay? Um, we already talked about this, just that s something during the course of their being there upsets them to the point where now they become violent or destructive to property, or even verbally aggressive. That can be a form of workplace violence too. Now, employee violence. Well, one thing I wanna mention about client violence is it can be premeditated. So if they're really, really monumentally upset with the Pikes Peak Library District about all these fines and not being able to use a computer or not being able to check out the book that they want and they let this build up over time and they feel like their needs aren't being met and a resolution that satisfies them is not happening, they can decide, well, I'm just going to go and blow that place up. I'm just going to go in there next week and I'm just going to shoot everybody. I was going to mention too, I mean, sometimes we get patrons who are already upset to begin with mm -hmm. and the fine or whatever is just the little straw that breaks the camel's yes. back. And we talked extensively about that in the verbal de-escalation class, how sometimes the root of the problem is not what occurred here at the library, but that was the final straw. But I do want you to think about if you know of a client or a user, what do you call them here, patrons or users? Patrons. patrons. So if you have a patron that you know you've had history with, that is hostile and upset, do you warn people, do, does, do you let security know about that? Do they let you know about that in case you see this person come in? Yeah. Okay, because what can happen is they let these feelings fester and then weeks down the road, sometimes even months down the road or longer, they can come back and decide all their problems in life are due to what happened to them here at the library and now it's time to act. And that's when they can come and be destructive or be violent and just come in and, and do an active shooter or come in and set explosives or come in and just be verbally hostile. So you do want to keep an eye on those known people who could be potential threat elements. Okay. Um, 
what about, and you may not know this, but I tell other businesses this, if you are having an issue with an ex-husband, ex-wife, ex-boyfriend, girlfriend, or even a family member that maybe you have a restraining order or protection order against, you should at least let security know that because there is the potential for that person to show up at the workplace. And it really isn't fair to everyone else here to not have some kind of heads up. So for example, let's say that I work here at the library and my husband comes and picks me up for lunch every day and we go to lunch. And now, you know, we're going through a very nasty divorce and you all don't know that. And I have a protection order against him and you all don't know that. And I'm at work tomorrow and he comes at the lunch hour and says, you know, where's Lori? And you, you let him on back to the private work area or my office not knowing all of this history and then he shoots me. Or he shoots all of you to get to me. So I don't know how that's normally handled here at the library. You probably have policies and procedures regarding that and there isn't any reason to air your private business to everybody who works here, but security should at least know that so that they can have a heads up. Or I as an employee should say, hey, you know what, um, my husband and I split, don't let him in here if he comes looking for me or don't let him back. And this is more common in areas that you normally need a card key to get in the back of. I do some companies that, you, that are secure. So to get past the reception area, you have to be let in or escorted. And there have been instances in those companies where people who've normally been friendly with an employee have just been let back when they shouldn't have been. So those are some things to think about. And they could be another type of family member too. Mom, dad, brother, sister, a child, could be anyone. We already talked about this um, as far as the person being verbally abusive either prior to the violence or in conjunction with the violence or just verbal abuse and no violence. I want to go back to anger being directed at the company. So. As a coworker, you may be angry at another coworker, and the act of workplace violence is between you and that coworker. So maybe I destroyed something on your desk or broke personal picture frames that you had on your desk. But maybe I'm dis or we got in a fight at work. But maybe I, as an employee, am disgruntled with the Pikes Peak Library District as a whole. I think I've been slighted. I've been wronged. I'm upset with them. I get fired. Okay, and then I come back later and commit an act of workplace violence. And it can be much later. Here's an example. I work here at the library. Problems arise. I get fired. I have a big chip on my shoulder that, you know, <coughs> I blame the library for a lot of things. So I get fired. I can't find another job. Now I lose my house. Now my husband's upset with me. I don't have a job. He leaves. Now I lose my car because I can't pay my bills. So this could be a year down the road, a year and a half down the road. My life has gone to crap, and I ultimately blame it on the library because in my mind, that's where all the issues started. I got fired from there, and if I hadn't got fired from there, none of this other stuff would have happened in my life. And so now a year and a half later, I come back and decide I'm going to blow the library up. So I want you guys to think of workplace violence as potentially a long-term concern. <coughs> so when an employee is let go or fired or leaves under disgruntled circumstances, just because they're gone, it doesn't necessarily mean that you put them out of your mind. And just keep in the back of your mind that if this person had violent tendencies or seemed extremely disgruntled when they left, that things can change in their life that could cause them to come back a year or two down the road. Any questions about that? All right, so here are some types of workplace violence that we're going to go through. Verbal violence. I think that you've probably all heard verbal violence. It can include cussing and swearing. It can include threats to your life or your property. Or it can include degrading remarks or put-downs. That's all considered forms of verbal violence. And if it happens here at the workplace, that is a form of workplace violence. Any questions or comments regarding that? It is something that you should, at minimum, if you think it's a minor incident, report to security. Mm -hmm. What if it's only the phone? That's a good question. <coughs> we get that, too, at the police station where people just get so upset over the phone. And 
if I answer the phone and I'm talking with the citizen and they become that upset, then I just make a statement that says, when you're ready to talk to me about this issue reasonably, you're welcome to call back, but I'm not going to talk with you while you're treating me like this and I'll hang up. Now, if it's a, a client that you know who they are, who the, a patron and you know what their name is, you definitely want to write down their information, tell your supervisor and tell security in case something comes of that later, in case that person next shows up down here, because that's a potential. They get upset because you wouldn't engage them on the phone, so now they're, darn it, they're gonna drive down here and they're gonna talk to somebody. So if you know who it is you're speaking with, then do write that information down, tell your supervisor, and tell security. Okay. Property damage could be anything. It could be slashed tires in the parking lot, it happened at work, smashed windshields, things that happen outside, it could be things that happen inside. Um, ripped up books, you know, destruction to the books, destruction to the computers, destruction to any property that's in here. It can be coworker on coworker, where I'm upset with you and so while you go to the restroom, I go over to your desk and I smash the picture of your dog that you have on it, all right? I know. And if that happened to me, I'd be calling the FBI. <laughs> I mean, they could smash, you know, my husband's picture. But not my dog. I, yeah, so that's workplace violence. And obviously, you need to report that. Obviously, that wasn't an accident. So you need to make sure you're letting your supervisor know and that you're letting security know about that. And sometimes that damage to property can be because I feel like I'm upset I didn't get my raise and so I'm gonna destroy some files on the computer or I'm gonna do something subtle that's gonna cause maybe an issue for the library but you may not know that I'm the one that did it and I still work here. That happens at workplaces all the time. Okay. Physical violence. Okay. Physical violence can be harassment and that's the most minimum form of what we would consider physical violence. And harassment is um, a statute that we as police officers charge all the time because so many things fall under the harassment statute. It's 189111. It's one of the only ones I've memorized because we charge it so much. So harassment can be something as minor as verbal harassment or repeated contact with the same person at inconvenient times, at inconvenient hours, to the point where it's disruptive to your life. That could be through email, through the telephone, or through showing up constantly at your workplace or at your home. That's considered harassment. But one of the harassment portions is pushing, shoving. So that's kind of the most minimum form of physical violence could be um, part of the harassment statute where you're pushed or shoved, right? Now escalating that, um, harassment also has a portion of you're being threatened now. As I threaten you that I'm going to kill you, or I threaten that I'm going to slash your tires, or I threaten that I'm going to do something horrible to you. That's also a form of harassment, and that only need be done once. So whereas to charge you um, under one part of harassment, wh where the repeated communication at inconvenient times that's disruptive to your life, that has to happen repetitively and there has to be a history of it. You know, I've called 20 times in the last week or I've sent you 100 emails this week. But if I actually threaten you with violence, threaten your life, threaten to harm you, I only need to say that once for me to be charged with harassment under that part of the statute. And then if I push or shove you, again, that only has to happen the one time and I can be charged with harassment. So it's kind of a catch-all statute and we use it a lot. Stalking falls under harassment. Um, escalating up from that then would be assault, would be third degree assault. Third degree assault would be I punch you. Okay. So remember under harassment it might be I grab you, I push or shove you. Um, third degree assault is going to be maybe I punch you. Okay. Or a, a misdemeanor assault. I punch you, um, I shove you down and you get bruised. You might get some injury, but it's going to be minor injuries that you're going to recover from and you're going to have no permanent physical ramifications from that. You might have a big bruise on your leg where I kicked you, but 
it's going to go away and you're not permanently injured. That's a misdemeanor assault. A felony assault is going to be an assault that I harm you and you're going to have permanent disfigurement, you're going to have permanent scarring, or I break a bone, or I use a weapon. If I use a weapon during the assault, that's also automatically a felony. So you can see how these things escalate. All of these can fall under workplace violence, physical violence. Any questions about those? And obviously homicide in the most is the most extreme form of physical workplace violence. All right, now let's talk a little bit about types of violence because you may not be sure whether to report something or whether, you know, is this really workplace violence? Does it fall under what our human resources tell us is workplace violence? Should I tell security? Should I just let it go? Um, and you need to be able to recognize a threat when it's a threat and you need to recognize when you're being coerced or intimidated. So intimidation is an explicit warning that you're gonna be harmed, okay? I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to slash your tires. I'm going to punch you. I'm going to kill you. And intimidation can be used to get something from you. Like, if you don't do this, I'm going to hurt you. Or it can just be two employees not getting along for some reason, and so they start threatening each other and intimidating each other because one of you is going to back down eventually. Could be uh, patrons doing that, too, you know? I'm sick of you telling me that I owe fines and I'm just, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to wait till you get off work and I'm going to beat the crap out of you. Those are all forms of intimidation. Now, the, the result that the person gets out of the intimidation may just be psychological, it may just be a feeling of gratification that they frightened you or intimidated you, or they could want something specific. You're going to take these fines off my record or else I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to wait for you to get off work and I'm going to beat you up, okay? Threatening, that's a direct warning, it's part of intimidation, right? You all recognize a direct threat, hopefully, because if you are directly threatened, it's something you need to make note of. It's something you need to report to your supervisor, and it's something you need to report to security. And I just gave you examples of some direct threats, and all of that is part of intimidation. Now, there's another thing that can be intimidating, and that's coercion. Coercion um, is a little more subtle sometimes, but it could be blatant. And coercion would fall under the examples I gave you that I want a result from this. I want my fines dropped, and if you don't do that, I'm going to slash your tires. You will drop all my fines off my record or else. That's coercion. So I'm trying to use some degree of force to get you to change something for me, to make something happen, okay? I'm going to, or, and not probably in this circumstance unless it's a coworker, um, but maybe you're a supervisor and you've told an employee, no, you can't have these days off, or no, you can't go to this training, and I want you to change your mind about that, and so I use coercion to get you to change your will to get you to do something you normally wouldn't choose to do, but because I'm coercing you, you're going to do it. Okay. Um, veiled threats are something I want to mention, and it falls under all three of these things that we talked about, intimidation, threatening behavior, and coercion. There's a veiled threat. Do you all know what that is? A veiled threat is I am threatening you, but I'm not coming right out and making it apparent that I'm threatening you. So. I might say, if I'm your supervisor and I just told you, no, you can't go to this training that's in Pueblo next week, we need you here, and for whatever reason, you just really, really, really want to go, and it means a lot to you, so you catch me some, sometime later today when I'm alone, and you say, I really need you to approve that training for me, because it's really icy outside, and I sure would hate for you to fall when you leave work tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that's a veiled, that's kind of a blatant example, but that's a veiled threat. That's not an act of concern? Come on. <laughs> or I really need you to buy these Girl Scout cookies from my daughter because she's trying to win this prize with her Girl Scout troop, and, you know, I really need you to buy these. And you tell me, well, I'm on a diet, or I can't eat that, and I'm not interested, and I say, well, I really need you to buy them. Um, 
I sure would hate for you to fall when you leave the office today. <laughs> Those are veiled threats. They're forms of coercion and intimidation. And you all know when they happen to you. And sometimes they can be subtler than that, subtler than my example. But hopefully you recognize when that's happening to you and you don't take that lightly. And you report that to security and your supervisor. But what am I going to do when they come talk to me? Well, I didn't threaten her. I just asked her if she wanted to buy some cookies and that I sure hope she didn't fall when she leaves. <laughs> It's a little easier for people to try to explain away what they said because they didn't come right in, out and say, if you don't buy these Girl Scout cookies, I'm going to push you down. <laughs> right? But you knew what I meant. Okay. So really be able to recognize when it's more subtle than the example that I gave, too. That's the kind of thing I think our security staff gets sometimes. I know what time you close or I know where you park. Yes. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, something. And those, sorta. I would consider that those threatening comments. I know where you live. I know which car out there is yours. Just remember, I know what time you get off work. I know what time you come in in the morning. Now, wouldn't you feel threatened if, if I said that to you? <laughs> but the words in themselves are not threatening, right? Oh, I know which car you drive. But I didn't mean it that way when I said it to you, did I? So those are really subtle threats and recognize them for what they are. I feel threatened because that's been told to my partners and I won't park anywhere near them when I'm... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not speak for collateral damage. That's good crime prevention. I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. That is good. So don't discount it when people say things like that to you. Tell your supervisor and tell security, hey, this patron, so-and-so, you know, wasn't happy about this, and th this is what they said to me. They said that I know what time you get to work in the morning, and I know what you drive. And I felt threatened by that. And if any of these end up getting reported to the police, it's really important in cases of harassment and threats and intimidation and menacing. Menacing is when um, violence is threatened against you. It's another statute. That you explain how that person's comments made you feel at the time. I was afraid. It made me feel afraid that he was going to hurt me. He said that he knows what time I get to work in the morning and he knows what I drive. I felt threatened by that. I felt afraid. I'm worried that he's going to hurt me when I get to work. You, these are, are crimes that it's very important when you're interviewed about him, when you give a statement to an officer or to security, that you tell them how that made you feel. And if you say, oh, it didn't worry me at all, I wasn't worried about it, then it takes away from that crime having occurred. If it didn't make you feel threatened or make you feel fear or make you worried that you were going to be hurt, then a crime didn't actually occur. Any questions about that? Because the intent behind that person's words is important in some of these crimes. There has to be intent to cause alarm. So one of the things when we write up incident reports is that we ha kind of state the facts. Mm -hmm. So I guess, would it be something where if something like that happened, we kind of state the facts and then maybe say, because of what the person said, this is how I felt. Like is it a fact that, that you felt afraid? Oh, okay. Is it a fact that you yes. felt intimidated by those remarks? Mm -hmm. So it's very important in these types of person crimes that you articulate how it made you feel at the time. Were you in fear of bodily injury or death? Were you in fear of property damage? Did you feel threatened? It's really important how you took the remarks. So yes, that needs to be documented. And it's, you're documenting the facts and part of those facts are, the fact is it made me feel, feel afraid. The fact is I felt threatened by what he said and now I'm worried that he's gonna hurt me. Okay, that's factual because it's how you felt at the time. Okay, okay but that was a really good question. I'm sorry to go back to the that's phone okay. thing, but I work the switchboard <laughs> in the district sometimes, and and people are anonymous most of that mm -hmm. time, and they feel the need to criticize and, and tell you how stupid your renewal line is mm -hmm. or, or whatever, and they get pretty violent with their, with their comments, so... 
I would just keep a log. That's not something you're necessarily going to be in danger from because they don't know who you are, correct? Right, and they, I don't think a lot of them know where the switchboard is. Right. And I think they're just so frustrated because they can't get a live person and then they finally get a live person that they have to. What I would out. just do, and I keep a call log at my office because, because I have to... I'll check my messages and I'll log every call in a call log and then I'll call everyone back and I'll put in that call log the result of, of the call. What happened when I called this person back? Yeah, I scheduled to go out and do a security assessment for them. Yes, I scheduled to go do a presentation at the library. Or I couldn't help this person and referred them to the robbery unit. So you might consider keeping a log just of those calls where people are disgruntled or people are threatening because if if something happens down the road, the police department can find out. If you wrote down, you know, 1001, um, spoke to a caller regarding fines, you know, caller became upset, threatened me, threatened the library, cause just in a little log, and then something happens later, we can always go back with the phone company and find out who that caller was. Yes, it would take some investigation and it would take some work, but if something major happened, I can tell you that we would do that. Okay. And you can keep it on a piece of paper, or they have voicemail logs, they call them, at Office Depot or Office Max, and it has a place for the date, time, phone number, caller, and then a, a place for you to write some notes, and that's what I use. Okay. Or you can just put it in a computer if you're sitting at one. All right, so let's talk about why people become agitated. Well, not so much why, because we've talked about that in other classes, but what they go through in their psyche when they're becoming agitated. Psychic imbalance. This is when a person's just a little off. I'm just not feeling myself today. I just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm kind of just having a bad day for whatever reason. I'm not feeling centered and focused, and I'm just off today. We all have days like that, and it is normal. Would you agree? Yeah. All right, so that's normal. It's not a big deal unless it starts happening every day. It wasn't just today and maybe tomorrow that I felt this way. Now it's been three weeks that I feel this way. So now it's become what we call chronic, <coughs> meaning every single day I wake up, I'm off. I'm not centered. I'm not happy. I'm things just aren't right, and I'm pretty much upset about everything. That's chronic anxiety, and the person's agitation has reached a point where they can no longer control it, and now they're taking it out on other people. When you're having just a bad day, you might be a little more cross than usual, but normally you don't verbally assault someone or physically assault someone or damage property if you're just having one bad day. But let's say you've had one bad day for about 60 days in a row. And now it's just become impossible for you to control. You can no longer control your mounting agitation, and now you start to verbally and physically lash out. So now I'm mad at you, and I kick this chair over in front of you. I punch a wall. I start cussing or yelling when I normally wouldn't. That's chronic agitation, and it starts to show. And what happens when this goes on day after day after day is now I hate everybody, I hate the world, and I no longer see you as my coworkers or my friends or family or anybody that I care about. You're just some person that I can no longer identify with, and that's bad. Why is it bad for me to start seeing people like that? Because now do I care if you get hurt? Do I care what happens to you? No. Okay, and then I externalize it. I no longer see you as individuals. I, I no longer even maybe remember your names. I just see a blur of faces. I don't care about you or what happens to you. I have all this agitation and hostility that's built up, and now I externalize it by coming in and shooting you all, or coming in and punching you in the face, coming in and blowing up the building, driving a car through the front doors, smashing windows, breaking in after hours and smashing all the computers burning all the books. I've done something to externalize those feelings that have built up and built up and built up. Warning signs that this could happen to somebody or that this is building up in somebody. And again, one of these by itself may not mean that this person's gonna 
come in and go nuts. You've got to look at the totality of the circumstances and the big picture. A history of violence doesn't necessarily mean the person's going to be violent now, but it can be a factor. It's something to look at in the overall scheme of things. Some type of disturbing behavior. Now, you may not know somebody has a history of violence, but maybe human resources does, or maybe security does. Somebody should probably know that if you're employed here, because hopefully a, a background check's been run on you. Okay. Disturbing behavior, do we all know what that could be? What could, and I'm sure you see disturbing behavior here. Maybe um, not as much here as at uh, downtown, but <laughs> I'm sure you see disturbing behavior, right? It may be disturbing sexual acts in public. It might be um, talking to themselves or doing strange things while using the library. It may be strange things that they say verbally. It could be how they're acting or what they're saying. Anything that's just not normal, because you know what normal users do and say and how they act in the library. And you should be able to determine when someone's deviated from normal library use behavior, right? Romantic obsession. If somebody has a romantic obsession with somebody that's not being returned, and that's usually what an obsession is, and you're noticing this, it can be a red flag. Right? So I'm a library patron, and I just become infatuated with somebody who works here at the library. And um, I've asked that person out, and they keep saying no, and so I followed that person after work and showed up at the grocery store where they're shopping or showed up at their house, and now it's turning into stalking behavior. Right? If that ha is happening, you need to tell someone that's a huge red flag because that's not normal. Okay. It doesn't mean because somebody asked you out one time, now there's an issue. It means that that behavior now becomes abnormal. Okay? Maybe they've asked you out two or three times, you've said no. A normal person may try more than once, but eventually they're going to say, fine. She doesn't want to go out with me, or he doesn't want to go out with me. Um, but if that's happening, and they're just not getting the hint, and now you're seeing some of these other things, like following you, leaving you notes, sending you emails, leaving phone messages, showing up, in places where you work or where you <coughs> frequent, like the gym or church or your grocery store or wherever else that you go, that's creepy and that's abnormal. Chemical dependence and deep depression, those things can be individual or they can be related. And if you notice a coworker or a patron having these issues, it can be a red flag that something could worsen down the road. And if it's a coworker, you might want to discreetly say something to your supervisor. You know, I'm not trying to get in so-and-so's business, but I have noticed that over the past few weeks, they have just seem really down and it's gotten worse and now I actually think they're depressed and I'm a little bit worried about them. And then it's up to human resources or your supervisor to reach out to that person and check on them and make sure they're okay and see if they need anything. If you notice a, a regular patron that's like that, I already know from teaching the other classes that you have resources for them. And you might just quietly and discreetly say, hey, I've, I noticed you've been coming to the library for about a year, and these last couple of weeks you've just seemed like something's really bothering you. Um, I'm not trying to get in your business, but just so you know, here are some resources that are available. And then just leave it at that. But you've got to make note of it, and if there's no intervention is when these people can now a month or two down the road be the ones coming back and doing something violent. Usually there are pre-incident indicators, actually not usually, there are always pre-incident indicators to an active workplace violence. And you just may not recognize them or you may recognize them and at the time didn't want to get involved or thought I don't want to get in that person's business or it's not my concern. And then now it's a few weeks later and it's escalated into something bad. So you want to do something. Don't just let things go. The pathological blamer, thats it's never my fault. It's always someone else's fault. It's never my fault that something happens. I take no responsibility for anything. It's always on somebody else. It's on the, it's the library's fault. It's your fault. It's the police department's fault. Right? It's someone else's fault. And so if I'm an individual that almost 100% of the time blames everybody else, 
for bad things or unfortunate things that happen to me, eventually I'm going to start taking things out on those other people who I blame. <coughs> Impaired ability to function. And this could be because of numerous reasons. But if you notice someone having memory difficulties, showing up late for work, being sleepy when they're at work, their job performance starting to decline, um, changes in behavior when they're driving, changes in their phone behavior, just changes in their behavior and their ability to do their job, those are red flags that something's going on with that person. And you may not know what it is, but it isn't normal. If I'm normally an A-plus employee, and I'm always at work right on time, and I'm always very productive when I'm here, and I'm very friendly with coworkers and with patrons, and you just have no problems with me, and now I start showing up a couple minutes late, I oversleep one day, I'm calling in sick now a lot, and when I am at work, I start making mistakes, I start forgetting things, that's a red flag. So you need to tell someone, hey, I'm worried about this person. Maybe you should talk to them, or maybe we should see if they need anything because it's just not normal that she's behaving this way. Okay. Now, some workplaces make the mistake of, hey, your performance is declining. You better straighten up or you're out of here. Right? And maybe, maybe that is going to ultimately be the case down the road, but you need to make sure first, if it's that drastic of a change in work behavior, that something isn't wrong and that person doesn't need help. Give them the opportunity to fix it in a nice way first before you just threaten them and say, hey, sh you know, you better shape up or you're fired. <laughs> All right, elevated frustration with the environment. So could be a patron. You know, I'm just so sick of these computers not working right. <laughs> I'm so sick of them being so slow. I just, I'm tired of it. And it gets worse and worse every day. Or it could be somebody who works here. You know what? I'm sick of the Pikes Peak Library District. They never give us a raise. They never do this. They never do that. I'm just getting tired. And you start complaining incessantly, chronically, about your employer. That can be a red flag. Okay. Interest in weapons. Now, an interest in weapons just by itself doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad <laughs> thing. Lots of people have an interest in guns or knives or weapons, and that's kind of a hobby. But if you have an interest in those things and some of these other things are going on at the same time, well, obviously, what's going to be the first thing that you fall back to? If I have a gun collection and I really am into shooting, and for 20 years of my life I've done it as a hobby and it's been no problem, and now suddenly I'm depressed, I'm disgruntled with work, I feel like my life's falling apart, and I've had chronic anxiety for so long that now I'm feeling like I need to externalize it, what's the first thing I'm probably going to turn to? I'm going to grab one of my guns and I'm going to go shoot somebody. So I don't want you to just think, oh my gosh, this person has a gun collection. They could be dangerous. Well, theoretically, they could be dangerous if all these other things are going on too, but they aren't necessarily dangerous just because they have the guns. Okay? Personality disorders or psychological disorders in conjunction with these other things can precipitate an act of workplace violence, right? So there are people with personality and psychological disorders that function very well in life forever. And then there are those who fall off the wagon, so to speak, aren't taking medication, aren't, aren't managing their lives properly. Some of these other things start to occur and now they can't take it anymore and they lash out. Financial problems, huge, right? When I taught in-service to our police officers three years ago, we have them all do scenarios. And I don't know if you ever do scenario training here, but we have our officers do scenarios. And the scenario we came up in, I don't know if you remember in 2009, is really when we started having some economic problems in the country as a whole. And so our scenario was a depressed person sitting in the park and uh, they've been there all day, and so somebody called in to check the welfare, and the officers approach this person and find out they lost their job, and eventually their house got foreclosed on, their wife and kids left because they were you know, not working now, and they didn't have a place to live, and all they had left was their car, which they were living in, and they had come to the park to uh, suicide. So that was the scenario we gave the officers. Very realistic scenario, I think, in these times, that financial stress 
can cause people enormous emotional and psychological grief and problems. And they reach a point where they just feel like they can't handle it anymore and they, they externalize their agitation and their frustration. So don't discount financial problems as a small thing. It can be a major, major thing because it affects so many other things in people's lives. Same with marital or family issues. Okay? And those things can crop up at the workplace. That might be that reason why that person's now having an impaired ability to function at work is because they're going through a divorce or they have a teenage son or daughter who's um, in drug rehab now and they just can't help them or anything like that that has to do with family. Is, I guarantee you're going to have some impaired ability at work because you can't have major issues going on in your life, financial or family-wise, and not have it affect other areas of your life, which is why you need to check on these people first and not just go up and give them more to worry about. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to lose my job now. You know, I'm going through a divorce, and I'm having issues with my teenage son, and now I'm going to lose my job if I don't straighten up might want to inquire as to if everything's okay with them before you start threatening um, workplace discipline. Okay? And we talked about how domestic violence can occur at the workplace. And domestic violence by statute is defined not just as a boyfriend-girlfriend intimate situation, but can also be people you're related to. Like a mother, father, son, daughter. Anybody you're related to is considered a domestic so how do we avoid these things from happening? Well, one, careful screening of, in this case, it would be employees. You don't get to screen your patrons. Some businesses get to screen who they take on as patients or clients. You don't get to do that here. Anybody can use the library, right? So the screening process would be internally when you hire people or when you take on, do you have volunteers at the library? So when you hire a paid employee or a volunteer, you want to do an adequate screening process. You want to have fair disciplinary practices, and I've alluded to that a little bit. Just because someone's late for a week doesn't mean you just fire them without finding out why. There might be mitigating circumstances as to why suddenly your good employee is late five days in a row. If you have fair disciplinary practices, even when something's done wrong or inappropriately, people will respect that. Okay. An organized response. So when I tell my supervisor that I feel threatened by what someone said, and I tell, or I tell security <coughs> that I'm going through a divorce and I have a protection order against my husband, there needs to be an organized response for how the library deals with things. You can't just wing it. It shouldn't be something that's not in any of your policies. You should have a plan for, all right, this is how we deal with a disgruntled patron. This is how we deal with if an employee's having an issue emotionally. This is how we deal with if an employee's been threatened. This is how we deal with an employee who has a restraining order against somebody. All right, you should have an organized response to things. Access controls, tough in the library. Some businesses have good access control points, and those are businesses that I work with like Boeing, Northrop Grumman, some city and county buildings where you're not getting past the reception area unless you have a card key or an escort. Unfortunately, this is a soft target. A soft target are places that the public can enter, and it's open to the public. Malls are soft targets, libraries, schools places where anybody can just walk into and it's intended for public use. All right? So access control is going to be difficult. You really have no access control other than the doors lock at a certain time. Once the library is open, anybody can come here. Do you ever trespass people from the library or restrict people from not being able to be here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you've done that and it's going to be very important that everybody knows who those people are because your only access control to keep mm -hmm. them out is somebody recognizing them and going to security and saying, John Smith is in here and he, he's been banned from the library. Okay. Communication skills, and I think those of you who've taken some of the other classes understand how important communication skills are. I've taught conflict resolution and dealing with hostile people to library employees over the past couple years. And we talk extensively in those classes about how you talk to people is important. The demeanor that you have, the tone you use in your voice, and the words you choose 
can be critical to the outcome of an encounter. And so just think before you speak. And don't be the one to escalate things. Don't be the one to fly off the handle and get angry and start cussing at the other person. You are the one that needs to remain calm and professional. And um, calm and professional, that's how you should remain. EAP. Do you guys have EAP available here? That's the Employee Assistance Program. It's probably the same EAP that we use at the police department. You call a number, you make an appointment, you get to see somebody, and your workplace doesn't know that you've gone. I mean, EAP knows who you are and why you're there, but they don't call, then call your workplace and say, hey, you know, Maria was in here today telling me about how she's having issues with her son. Your work never knows that you went to EAP. It's, it's a good service. Um, as far as the anonymous part about your workplace isn't going to be in your business. Now, I do know and I've heard, because I'm on our peer support team for the police department, I've heard good and bad about EAP. Some people have said the counselor I got just was awful, they didn't help me at all, and other people say, wow, it was great, I'd use them again. So that's going to be on an individual basis, but the process is a good one. Um, practice the golden rule. Treat other people how you want to be treated. Put yourself in their shoes, and if you were in their shoes, how would you want other people to handle you <clears throat> in that circumstance? Make sure that you get employee participation and employee awareness to policies and procedures regarding workplace violence, harassment, regarding if an employee is having a difficult situation. Everybody needs to know what the procedure is for dealing with that so you feel comfortable accepting those services, you feel comfortable going to your workplace about issues you're having, or that you, as somebody who's recognizing an issue with someone else, feels comfortable going to your supervisor about it, knowing that they're just not going to run over and fire that person. Okay? And then part of the awareness is everybody needs to be aware of these red flags to look for, these pre-incident indicators to a potentially violent person. And you need to not be afraid to say something when you recognize them. Because when you ignore them, then something happens down the road. And you think back, oh, you know what? This person did this, this person did that. Probably should have saw this coming. Because people just don't snap. Well, I don't know what happened. They just snapped. They just went crazy. No, they just don't do that. Things led up to that. And there were signs that people ignored or didn't recognize. They just didn't know what to look for. All right. Any questions about workplace violence? Now you all know how to commit acts of workplace violence. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if you do have any questions later, um, Jim Barentine no longer works at the Gold Hill Division. He's now the emergency manager for Pike Street Community College. But my information is still correct. And you're always welcome to call me. Okay? All right, thank you. Thank you.